Hey, and welcome to the Hero's Journey podcast, series two, episode five. And we're continuing on with the series, The Matrix Reconstructed, the the psychology and symbolisms of the matrix. So we finished off the last episode uh, where Neo and Morpheus had just come back out of the matrix. And Neo was asking, if you die in the matrix, do you die in reality? And Morpheus tells him, yes, that the body cannot live without the mind and it demonstrates how real the things that we believe in our minds can affect our reality Um, so things like self-doubts low self-esteem and so on and so forth can crush the body and depression can lead to a lack of exercise interaction with others going outside and eventually the body can waste away because the mind is sick So it's important to keep the mind healthy if you want the body to also thrive and survive as well. So that brings us to the need for us to go deep into our unconscious and find the things that are lurking down in our unconscious, secretly holding us back, whatever the anxieties or fears are. And then we have to face them and overcome them. So I have to remember also that Neo is on a journey to free himself from his own doubts about who he is and the film teaches us a lot about us freeing ourselves from our own self-doubts too so after he comes out the matrix uh he goes to rest and while he is sleeping trinity comes in with food to strengthen him but he's asleep so she leaves the food there now again Uh, Trinity has come to help him while he's asleep and that's a recurring theme throughout the film Trinity comes to Neo while he's asleep a lot and that represents uh, Trinity as his anima the feminine counterpart coming to give love guidance and strength from deep within his unconscious feeding him the things that he needs to know uh, on an intellectual level from within his conscious his unconscious to help him become stronger so when he is awake when he is in the real world when he is conscious he has those abilities that knowledge that understanding now neo doesn't eat the food that she brings because he's asleep um but like i said it's just a symbol of what that how the anima works and how trinity represents the anima in his unconscious mind and at this stage uh trinity most likely represents the mary developmental stage of the anima um there's a website called frithluton.com that does a really good job of outlining all four stages of the anima development um so i definitely uh, recommend you looking at that to get a bit of a deeper insight um into the stages of the anima and what each stage represents and how it works and what its um, purpose is Uh, but i'll put a link to that website in the description as well so the mary developmental stage um is about virtue loyalty so trinity is um showing those qualities at this stage because she's showing that she's virtuous she's showing love she's showing loyalty to neo even though they're not actually partners uh, or romantically interested in each other at this stage quite yet. So she's showing loyalty by bringing him food and then subsequently defending him against Cypher, who um, is waiting outside to quiz Trinity about whether she loves Neo, whether she thinks he's the one, and also to sow doubt into her mind about whether Neo really is the one so she's showing loyalty to her man if you like um and and defending him against those um that seek to oppress him so when neo wakes up morpheus uh takes him for the first time to see what the matrix is in everyday life uh he shows him doctors nurses teachers bankers everyone like walking around in the city busy 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 like you would see in a typical city and he tells him that everyone in the matrix is a part of the system and that most people are not ready to be unplugged from it and leave the matrix um some are even so dependent on the system and the matrix for their way of life that they will fight 
to keep it in place and they'll fight the people that bring truth to them so that they don't have to wake up from the lie and we see that in everyday life a lot some people are so intertwined with the systems that are in place um, even though they know they're corrupt they will still fight to keep the illusion alive so that they can keep their own comfort zones in place so then Morpheus um, tells him a bit more about this and it goes on but then he surprises Neo with an agent uh, appearing right in front of him pointing a gun at him and then pauses the simulation there and he tells him that anyone who's not unplugged from the matrix has the potential to be used by the matrix to become an agent to oppress Neo interesting thing that just popped into my mind if you remember from the first part I said the, the film never really clearly outlines what uh, Smith and the agents are agents of are they agents of change are they agents of uh, uh, the state but maybe they're agents of oppression in this particular instance um, but it's quite profound that um, Morpheus says that anyone who's not unplugged from the matrix has the potential to be used by the matrix to become an agent because it teaches us a valuable lesson about being vigilant about who we keep around us because some people they may be family friends lovers if they're not conscious in the same way you are and seeking to understand self and come to a deeper understanding of themselves and the worlds and systems around them they're asleep and they could potentially become someone that causes your downfall or even worse they could betray you you know their motivations their desires their drives are unlikely to be in line with yours because most people who are not seeking truth or not seeking for a way to free themselves from the system mentally a lot of the time it means their minds are entrapped or intertwined with the systems and are working for them if you like um, and their motivations and their desires are gonna be to prosper and be successful within those systems so when there's you who is maybe showing them ways out of the system or doing things that are against the way they understand things to be done within the world system that's going to be a problem for them because there's a high chance that you're going to be saying and doing things that are going to be uh counterproductive or anti the things that do it they're doing and it could it could be many different things it really depends on what your personal journey and walk is. Um, so it's really good advice also for people in relationships. Like sometimes, a lot of the time, people join themselves to people who are on a completely different psychological and spiritual journey to them. And while it can work for a time, if that person that you join yourself with, that you align yourself with, is on a different path to where you're going, it's gonna cause a problem and it may man manifest in different ways like it could be that they try and change you and they try and get you to leave the path that you're on and follow the things or the way that they do things and you, you see that a lot um, people want to please their partner they want to be in love with their partner they want their relationship to grow and a lot of the time that means they sacrifice their vision it means they sacrifice their goals it means they sacrifice their plans in order to follow somebody else and a lot of the time that person hasn't got a better goal or strategy or vision than what they had but they're just they're joined to this person they want to be in love with them they want to be in a relationship so they follow the path that this person is on but ultimately that will destroy you and I don't mean just physically as well. I mean internally, you know, on a, when you look back on your life and you say, oh, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd have done that. You know, you may not say, I wish I never got with that person because they, you know, it depends on how much blame you put on other people. Ultimately, it's your choice. But you may look back on your life and say, oh, man, I wish I'd have done this while I was young or while I was this age, while I was that age. Another common thing that happens is um, they get bored of you. And they find someone else who better matches their way of thought and their lifestyles. And um, yeah, you know, you're not interested in the things that they want to do or the things that they do are not in line with your lifestyle. Like for me personally, it's no good me having a girlfriend that likes smoking weed and drinking and going out clubbing a lot because 
I don't do any of those things and they don't interest me. So I'm going to have a girlfriend who's into smoking weed, chilling, going, drinking a lot, uh, going clubbing regularly. When And that, what that means is she's going to be doing all those things and I'm going to be doing what I want to do. Creating podcasts, creating music, playing some computer, maybe going on some adventure, going on a, a bike ride or tour. And th those things are going to separate us because I'm going to want to do those things. And I'm going to be more inclined to spend time with people who enjoy doing those things as well. And she's going to be more inclined to spend, want to spend time with people who do the things that she wants to do. Like I said, it can work for a time. There is a period where you are infatuated with a person or want the relationship to work so much that you kind of put your desires or your, you suppress them but there's only a certain amount of time you can do that before resentment builds up because ultimately the things that you want to do your passions the, the more you kill them the more you kill yourself and if the person doesn't get bored of you a lot of the time what happens is they cheat on you before they break up with you because if they're moving in a particular friendship circle with people that enjoy the things they do and those relationships are building it's very likely that as a partner for them within that friendship circle it could even be at work um but what's likely is they're going to have a better bond with another person and then it's not fair for them or you because maybe they're having a really good connection with somebody that they really click with but they're with you and they don't want to hurt you or upset you so they stay with you out of loyalty see it gets very complex the best thing to do is just not like be so be self-aware you know and be real with yourself about what you really want and who you're aligning yourself with because ultimately not only is it going to waste your time but if they end up cheating on you and stuff like that it's it's going to be very difficult to recover emotionally and mentally and it's going to set you back on your journey so that was a little bit of a tangent but those are two examples of ways that aligning yourself with the wrong people can damage your walk and they're very common ways you know the bottom line is that the person's mind is not in line with yours it's elsewhere and where the mind is the body follows yeah that's why a lot of people there's a lot of cheating going on because a lot of people's minds are not connected with the partners that they're with and if their mind is not with you the body eventually is not going to be either and you know if people are not what you're on beyond relationships just keep it moving don't ignore it don't try to win them round or persuade them just note it and carry on if you don't it's going to inevitably cost you it's funny i was talking to my cousin yesterday uh one of my younger cousins and we were talking about relationships and whatnot and how some people try and persuade you that you like them or you should give them a try and whatnot and she said you know never try and force it you know um either they like you or they don't you know it's it's not you should never have to make somebody want you you know I, I think the same thing if you're trying to show your best all the time to convince somebody that they should hang around with you or they should date with you or anything like that then um it's not for you you know most of the time you you meet people and you click you know anyway who knows it's just there are there are many exceptions to every rule but in general that's how it goes and even morpheus says right you see an agent you run and that's because morpheus knows that at this particular stage neo isn't ready sometimes you meet people and at this particular stage in your life you are not ready to interact with that person so you you risk ruining something that could potentially be good if you go into it too quickly if neo was to go up against an agent in this state he would lose if you were to engage in a particular relationship or go for a particular job without the skills whatever it is i'm sure you can relate to it somewhere in your life it has the potential to destroy the opportunity Anyway, let's get back to the chronology of the Matrix. So Morpheus also says that everyone that has tried to fight an agent has died. It's like, <laughs> in terms of your life, don't don't try and fight the agents when you're not ready. And don't try to, f try to fight the agents when you don't need to. It's like, sometimes you'll see red flags. There's no point in trying to fight against the red flags. If you see the red flags, then you need to say, right, boom, I've seen the red flags. Let me divert now. Let me move away. Have you ever, ever heard this? 
you must have heard the saying, um, you dodged a bullet there. You know, um, when you maybe you got into a situation or was around certain people or anything like that. And for some reason, you, you got out. You ended the relationship, you left the job, you, you sold the car, whatever it was. And then later on, you hear that it turned out to be a train wreck or the person went you know, crazy or went downhill or whatever. And someone might say, oh, you dodged a bullet there because you managed to escape from the situation. Well, apply it to the way that you approach relationships, the way that you approach peak having certain people around you when you see red flags when you sense a thing just cut it off just keep moving and dodge the bullets and the reason why i use that analogy is because um morpheus tells neo that eventually he'll get to the point where he no longer has to dodge bullets now if you watch the matrix film there's a part where neo is on a roof of a building and one of the agents is shooting at him and he does this famous like bullet time slow down where he kind of goes like I don't know leans back to the point where he's almost uh, horizontal but he's not falling dodging the bullets and um, you know he, he can move so fast that he can dodge bullets but Morpheus tells him look there'll be a point where you no longer have to dodge bullets you Neo can see them come in and is able to stop them right in his tracks. So you want to be able to, you want to be at the point where you see the bullets coming, you see them firing towards you, but you make the necessary moves to stop those bullets right in their track, no longer having to dodge them. So let me just take a sip of water. After that little conversation, um neo neo wakes up from his sleep um and he goes for a little walk around the nebuchadnezzar the ship and he meets cypher uh who's looking at the source code of the matrix and he and neo begin to discuss why the matrix is in code and you know they have a little discussion about you know the, the language of the matrix and blah 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 and then Cypher uh, checks no one is looking and offers Neo a drink, a homemade alcohol. And he says it's great for doing two things, degreasing engines and killing brain cells. Now, you've got to watch out for these types of characters in your life. In movies, it's obvious. He is the Judas. He's the bad guy. He's the traitor, whatever you want to call him. But in real life it's very hard to spot these types of characters because we can't have an, uh, a third party perspective looking at it. We've got the first person perspective. We are in it. We can't take a step out of it and look. That's why we've got to be extra vigilant. And just like in this film, these people set themselves up as friends trying to help you out, give you advice, or even give you this cheeky little drink to sort you out. Like these types of people will ruin you. Neo is on the deepest, most significant psychological journey of development in his life. And then you've got Cypher, who we already know wants to kill Neo, giving him this drink, pretending to be his friend, saying, yo, this will help you kill some brain cells. Like Neo's brain is literally the one part of himself that he can't afford to be killing right now. But under the guise of a cheeky drink between crewmates he takes the drink and boom he's intoxicated and the next thing cypher's telling him that he wishes he took the blue pill and if you remember back to when uh morpheus offered neo a red pill or a blue pill the blue pill is to remain ignorant of the truth and cypher is telling him look i wish i took the blue pill and what he's doing is he's planting seeds of doubt in Neo's mind about whether the red pill journey is really worth it. And then he goes on to question why Neo is really there and why he really believes and, and whether he really believes what Morpheus has said about him being the one. Again, he's, he's trying to plant more seeds of doubt in Neo's mind. And then he tells Neo if he sees an agent, he better do what the rest of them do and run. Again, more seeds of doubt. 
Now, I think it's important to note that this is different to when Morpheus tells Neo to run from, from the agents. Morpheus is telling Neo to run because he's not ready yet. Because he ends his sentence with, when you're ready, you will not have to dodge bullets. Me and Neo will be so powerful once he gets to where he needs to be that the agents and their powers will be nothing to him. But Cypher, on the other hand, although he appears to be echoing what Morpheus is saying, he's not. He's telling Neo that he is no different from the rest of them. He's not special, he's not the one, and that he will die just like anybody else if he tries to take on an agent. It's a very subtle difference, but it's very important for us to uh, understand the subtle the subtlety of the of the message or the agenda behind the message because people will often use facts to convince us of a thing that is not true so although it may be fact facts that they're presenting it's not truth that's being presented and those are very different things so you've got to analyze the context and the intent of the person that's delivering that message and those facts because the same facts could be used for good or span for bad and we've all we've all met that character in our lives they've got their own securities weaknesses agendas and they project them onto us and entice us to follow it follow them in their ways under the guise of friendship or being mates you know a, a simple <laughs> simple tip yeah if you see someone living a lifestyle talking in a certain way acting in a certain way that doesn't fit with who you're trying to be or what you're trying to do do not follow a single thing that they do not a single thing even if the thing that they do is a common thing that everyone else does these people they're in your friendship groups they're your family they're in your workplace they're everywhere like if they're not unplugged they're still a part of the system look at cypher he's unplugged but he's dying to go back and he's dying to bring people with him like you don't follow him if you're like if your thing is you you don't drink and they're having a cheeky little drink don't don't drink if they're having a cheeky little smoke don't smoke like don't even go outside with them while they smoke because they're gonna want to have idle chit chat while they smoke they and you know idle chit chat is there's nothing to be gained in it yeah it's just gossip or hearsay just noise you know if they're if these people are at work and they're like leaving early because n nobody's gonna notice the boss ain't gonna care like everyone's hey, we're all going hey, hey let's go like don't go man just stay do your hours like you're gonna feel like the square one but at the end of the day you have to this is about your internal journey it's not about um, following what everyone else is doing or being or thinking to yourself, well, everyone else has gone. Why should I stay? Because this is your internal development. You're staying because you want to build your personal integrity, your personal discipline. These are the steps that you need to go through to develop yourself. If they're going raving and you're not on raving and they're just like, everyone's going, just come, don't be dead, don't be da -da -da -da, and it's really not your thing, just don't go. Unless you see the white rabbit, <laughs> unless you see a white rabbit tattoo, of course. But um, everything that those person or those people or that person is doing is likely contributing to their poor results. And... It's, it's part of the reason why you tell yourself that you don't want to be like them on a subconscious level. That person or those people, they get poor results because they make poor choices. Like, don't make their poor choices yours. Anyway, Neo realizes this is a, realizes this a little bit too late. And he thanks Cypher for the, for, for the drink and then he leaves. But Cypher's work is already done. It's the conversation that he wanted to have. He's not, he's not trying to kill Neo at this point. He's trying to damage Neo to the point that makes him vulnerable. So what he's done is he's sown these seeds of doubt. And he's also got the information that he was fishing for in order to betray the whole team. The information is... Morpheus has told Neo the fact that he is the one. Morpheus hasn't confirmed to the rest of the team at this point that 
he is the one. They know Morpheus thinks he's the one, but they don't know if he's confirmed to Neo he's the one. But Morpheus having this conversation has let him know that Morpheus thinks Neo is the one. Why is that important? Because Cypher's role is to be the Judas. He has to find out who the chosen one is so that he can betray that person to the agents you see cypher's role like all of the other characters is also defined by his name a cypher or a cypher that a cypher spelled c c i p h e r um is another it's another dual fold word um on one hand it's a type of encrypted code i remember what cypher was doing when neo walked in on him he was looking at and deciphering the code of the matrix also interestingly during the world war two world war two spies used ciphers to communicate and send messages so a cipher is also uh, a spy for the agents and it's a cipher is also codes that spies use so there's an intertwining of the meaning of his name and his actual role also interestingly again a cipher is also another term for a person that has no real value or no importance or no real personality and that kind of plays out in his character because he's shallow he's got really basic thoughts and needs and he's upset that he's not the one and he's upset that he doesn't get the girl um, which are no doubt contributing factors to his later betrayal of Neo and others. So in the very next scene, we see Cypher discussing uh, the properties of a steak with Smith. And he tells Smith he knows the steak isn't real, but it's so juicy and delicious. Um, and he understands that the Matrix is only telling his brain that he is that it is juicy and delicious and after nine years of being woke he realizes that actually ignorance is bliss if he ignores the fact that the matrix is telling him it's juicy and delicious then he can live happily he doesn't have to accept the truth that it's not real see cypher has decided to give up on the path of enlightenment He's given up on the path of consciousness and he wants to revert to living in the dream world. He wants to be back as part of the machine and the system, you know, because reality is too hard for him to live in. The real world is too difficult for him. It's too much discipline. There's too much of a lack of luxury. It's not fulfilling his desires enough. So he wants to trade truth for comfort and it's nothing uncommon. Um, the majority of people will do this you know i mentioned it before that some people will find uh the path to knowledge and enlightenment and become conscious but it will drive them crazy because they and they'll try to suppress it you know or ignore it or deny it to themselves or some people in worst cases they turn really hard to drugs and alcohol to uh suppress the knowledge that they have others will become so conscious and they'll make um they'll make the changes and start to move in new truth but they'll never let go of the the memories of the old comforts and they'll the longing for the old comforts will continue to build and build and build uh and and draw them back and you see that a lot in relationships when people go back to partners and situations that are just no good for them um you know at some point in the relationship they realize that the person or the situation was was no good for them you know they put and they put in hard work to leave and then over time the loneliness or waiting for someone new or maybe missing the old relationship sets in and they forget or choose to ignore why they left in the first place and they get drawn back in by the sweet and juicy steak that the old person appears to be offering you know uh, you know just like cypher they remember the taste they remember the smell and the juiciness of the juiciness of the steak and boom they're back in a toxic relationship uh enjoying the steak until eventually 
The realization that it was all a lie that they sold themselves sets in again. And everything that was wrong with their relationship is at the forefront and happening again. And then they wondering why the hell they went back. You see it over and over and over again. So Smith and Cypher are discussing this plan um, to betray the team Morpheus and Neo and Smith asks Cypher if they have a deal and Cypher responds by saying he doesn't want to remember anything nothing at all he, he wants all memories of what he's come to understand while he was conscious to be erased and he wants it to be erased because he knows that if he remembers at any time that the matrix isn't real it could ruin the state of ignorant bliss that he wants to be in again people choose to remain ignorant and even lie to themselves and pretend they don't know the truth in order to keep living in the comfort of the dream because again waking up and facing reality is hard work and there's you know there's no hiding from the work that you need to put in in yourself and in the real world in order to make things happen in order for it to work if you're watching or you do watch the film after this notice that cypher says he wants to be someone rich and important like an actor it gives us a good clue of the comforts that he wants or is longing for and the comforts that he would rather have over truth and he's willing to sacrifice truth in order to live in a comfortable life and we see that a lot today uh, you know, a good example is social media so many people are putting up and living out fake versions of themselves to be seen as important to uh, gain influence to gain likes and followers on their accounts and become people of influence while obviously making money in the process and there's nothing wrong with having a dream having a goal having a business plan and executing it there's, that's excellent what we're analyzing here with the film though is the psychological impact and process behind lying to yourself and ignoring and hiding truth of yourself in order to find comfort in order to influence in order to gain riches like not only are you selling yourself a dream but you're selling other people a dream as well uh, you could say that if you're doing that or the people who are doing that are a type of smith they're selling a dream in return for destruction of the truth all right so cypher and cypher and um smith they strike up this deal to uh betray and give up morpheus and that's the end of that scene so next we see the whole team on the nebuchadnezzar having breakfast and mouse um he's like i think he's like a, a mechanic on the ship um he he sparks a conversation about whether we can really know what anything tastes like and it, it's, it's an interesting point because he touches on an idea that i mentioned earlier about color and that if my perception of color is different from yours who is right and he says um he he thinks that the food that they're eating tastes like something called tasty wheat which is a cereal but how can anyone know what tasty wheat tells uh tastes like he says how do we know that tasty wheat doesn't actually taste like chicken and it's very interesting because taste is completely down to the receptors in my brain and my taste buds it, this is important because it links to the concept to a degree that even reality isn't real but it's relying on our experience and our interpretation of what's happening by our brains and it, it it works on the whole because the majority of our brains are working and, ex and experiencing the world in the same way so like i.e all our brains are functioning and interpreting data and information about taste about smell about color in the same way the reality is a collective experience that we're all ex you know experiencing together but of course there's always exceptions to the rule again there's always brains that are functioning differently and as a result 
they may be experiencing an alternate reality to ours different colors different smells different sounds different tastes different feelings just like what morpheus was telling neo in the early stages of his descent into the unknown when he defined what real is um what makes it dangerous though is when an idea or concept is introduced to the brain that is foreign and not able to be experienced by an individual you first hand for instance an idea or a theory or an experience that largely relies on the assurance of others that it is good because we can't experience or see it for ourselves like oysters and caviar are regarded as delicacies and where we believe the majority of people believe that they're worth paying exorbitant prices for however many of us have never really tried them to understand that and but many will tell you that they actually taste horrible and the experience is horrible when they first try it however the idea that this experience is worth paying for is so deep rooted that despite people knowing that it's going to be a bad experience and people telling them it's going to be a bad experience they still accept the, this idea that it's worth paying hundreds of pounds to experience caveat to experience something negative the, the point is that mouse it, it, while he's only talking about food he's alluding to the fact that a lot of time we believe something is simply because we've been told it is and in, in order to continue believing um, we have to accept and convince ourselves that it's true because we've been told so and despite sometimes feeling seeing hearing something contrary to that in our own experience we still go ahead with it what do you guys think about that let me know in the comments anyway so mouse moves on and he starts talking about uh, a woman that he designed within the matrix a program um and it, it's like a, a really attractive woman in a red dress blah, blah blah and he tries to uh tell neo look if you want to have a personal meeting with her you can and the rest of the team are like oh you know like pimp you know digital pimp or whatever they call him and then he says to deny our impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human and i thought that was an interesting idea because on one hand you could argue that what makes us human isn't our impulses in fact most people would say it, it our impulses are just inbuilt and largely reactionary like automatic responses same as animals you know um most would agree that what makes us human and what separates us from animals is our ability to think beyond our impulses and choose our reactions however in the matrix world which is programmed and controlled by machines that have managed to outthink humans and can plan and, an ass and assess potential outcomes uh, in order to make choices beyond that of the human mind so that they don't make no mistakes uh, is better than our level of thinking it's actually our natural impulses that separate us from the machines in the matrix world the machines don't act on impulse they only act on information data and calculations anyway let's move on from that one in the next scene the team head back into the matrix to see the oracle you have to note that the oracle lives inside the matrix and she's not a real person she is a program within the matrix and we just have to bear in mind that the the matrix is part of neo's unconscious mind every time we go into the matrix we're going into neo's unconscious mind so the oracle is also part of neo's unconscious so on the way neo recognizes a noodle place that he used to eat at and he questions the significance of still having memories of things from his life in the matrix things that never really happened they were just dreams excuse me because obviously up until this point his entire past has been lived within his mind but trinity tells him 
that the matrix cannot tell you who you are and neo says what but an oracle can and trinity says well that's different it's a very small idea but it's quite profound because neo remembers things from his past and he questions their relevance these things didn't even really happen but like i said they make up his history as far as he can he's concerned um these past events they're they are his life but he's dealing with memories they're not actual current events and trinity's response is letting him know that the past doesn't define who he is or who he's going to be it doesn't have a determining role in who he's going to become it's done and neo does not know who he is beyond his past that's all he knows and well up up to now and his current experiences that's all he knows of himself and it's very similar to us we don't know much of ourselves beyond what we've already experienced what we've already lived however it's important for us to know that on our journey to become new ever evolving individuals we can't be trapped by seeing ourselves through the lens of our past you know always referring back to past experiences things that have happened things that you've known places you've been people that you've been with like those are those may have got you to the point where you're at but they don't define where you're going or how you're going to get there that's why trinity says the oracle is different the oracle represents vision it represents seeing forward um the oracle sees ahead she sees potential uh, and directs it to where it can be most effective but the past doesn't do that the past doesn't see potential the past doesn't uh, give future direction it can inform choices um you know you can make informed decisions informed choices from your experience but again it can't realize any potential and we have to remember that in our current state we have potential we always have potential as long as we're alive we're functioning we're fully able we have potential to be more than who we currently are and who we have been but we need a vision to be able to see what we can be to be able to look ahead and say all right i want to be this i want to go here i want to see this i want to do this i want to become this you need to have vision to look ahead and you can't have that vision if you're constantly looking back and saying okay i am this i was that i did this i went here i am that the potential has to be directed by a vision right so morpheus tells uh neo um neo asks whether the oracle is always right and Morpheus tells him, don't think about things in terms of wrong and right. The Oracle is only a guide that can direct you to the right path. So like when you have a vision or an idea, you can get stuck on, is this the right thing to do? Is this the right way to go? Am I making the right choice? Is this the right path for me? Like you can't get stuck on that. You can't be afraid to fail or get it wrong. You just need to use the idea as a guide to aim yourself in the right direction if you feel like you want to try something try and become something try and learn something it may be the wrong it may i don't want to say wrong it may be it may not be the right thing but it will be a first step on aiming yourself in the right direction for the path that you need to be on you can't get to the point where you need to be without trying paths in order to get there yeah for me i started out volunteering as a youth worker in a youth club in hackney a couple of nights a week and it wasn't where i want to be wasn't where i've ended up but it was a it was a first step on the path to getting to where i am now i'm about to qualify as a teacher and be teaching in a college i'll be qualified to teach adults uh in colleges universities blah 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 blah. i had a vision that i wanted to work with young people work with people now that vision has evolved 
and progressed as I've taken steps and found, okay, I don't love being in a youth club all the time. I do like it. Let me move the, the direction. Let me move the compass a little bit that way. Okay, start heading that way. Start heading into secondary schools and special needs schools and then colleges. And, and it's just evolved like that. Each time, just adjusting the direction that I'm heading in a bit more, trying a little thing and say, okay, that's not quite right. Let me adjust it a little bit more, make that move. You can't get stuck thinking, ah, I don't know if this is the right career choice for me. So I'm actually not even going to take a step in doing it. I'm just going to, I don't know what you're going to do. Anyway, it's a bit of a tangent there. So they arrive at the Oracle's house and Morpheus tells Neo that he can only show him the door. Neo has to walk through it on his own. Like our journey, on our journeys, we're going to meet helpers, mentors, guides, people that are going to show us to the door. But we've got to be careful not to become reliant on their help and guidance. Because a time is going to come when we've got to be ready to go through the door on our own. In education, we call it scaffolding. Um, you build a metaphorical scaffolding around a student that allows them to climb the you know this educational ladder another metaphorical ladder but you don't hold their hand as they climb the scaffolding you just provide the scaffolding for in order for them to climb the reason you do that is because when you leave them when you move to a different school or a different job or they move into a different class that scaffolding is going to be gone and they need to be able to climb without it it's the same with this don't get too attached to mentors guides or who even partners because when those people people leave or you move on you're going to need to be able to stand on your own two feet and that's what Morpheus is telling Neo here look I'm here to guide you I'm here to show you the door that you need to walk through but I cannot walk through the door for you I cannot even open the door for you you have to date yourself um, so I think this is one of the most iconic parts of the film coming up now where Neo is waiting to meet the oracle and he sees all these different children uh, who are potentially the one and they're all demonstrating and practicing their uh, you know superpowers or abilities and Neo uh, is actually the oldest in the room and the least experienced with, uh, of using his abilities yet he's chosen he is the one and you know for a lot of us we can feel that maybe our time has passed. You know, we miss chances. There are other others who are better at the thing we want to do than us. And maybe they even we even feel that they're more worthy than us. But the thing is, you've got to remember that everyone has a unique calling, a purpose and powers that only they can manifest. Just because you're in the same field as somebody else doesn't mean that you and that person are going to do the exact same thing and perform the exact same function and make the exact same changes and differences. That's not how it works. If you have a calling in your heart, it doesn't matter what the odds are or the, who the opposition are, Like you have to pursue it. You can't allow what others have done or are doing or achieving to convince you that you're not good enough or can't do it it was you would you'd never you will never do anything then you know that's another dangerous thing about social media you can see things that people are doing in their careers in their little businesses in their relationships and be like damn like i'm so far behind like or i'm nowhere near as good as this person or whatever 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 um and it can it can really mess you up psychologically to the point where you just say right well i'm not i'm not even going to bother doing that because they're already these other people are already so good at it why <laughs> where do i fit in you know what is the what is the point um so neo sees a particular child uh bending spoons uh and he's intrigued by it and he he picks up the spoon and the child advises him do not try and bend the spoon that is impossible instead only try to realize the truth that there is no spoon then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends it is only yourself for me is the most iconic uh lines 
And the most mystical and profound uh, and philosophical lines of the film for me. Uh, because the boy is trying to show Neo that the spoon cannot be bent by the mind. Yeah, Physical things in the world cannot be changed or manipulated simply by thinking about or willing them to happen. You have to accept and understand that it is you yourself that must make a change. And it's you that has to bend in order to make a change on the external world. Your internal um, processes, your internal development and changes are what have to happen first in order for you to make an impact on the world. Neo has to accept that it is him that has to develop his ability that he has to believe in first. And then he'll realize that it, the spoon does not bend. Only he bends. And then as a result, the world around him conforms to his changes just like neo the first thing you have to do is free your mind sounds very airy fairy but you have to free your mind and what that means is knowing and accepting that only you have the power to change yourself if you want to affect things around you only you making changes to yourself accepting who you are accepting what your abilities are limited limitations are potential is and really seeking deep within yourself and saying who who am i what am i trying to be where am i trying to go all these deep things that a lot of people don't want to spend time finding out because it requires work it requires change it requires accepting the fact that ah i i actually have to get up and do something you got to focus on those internal unseen changes and developments before you can see the physical manifestation of that change that's why I think that that scene is one of the deepest uh, in terms of personal development for Neo and for us. Right, finally, Neo meets the Oracle and in my opinion, was the better Oracle because uh, they, they changed the Oracle to some other. I think the, the first lady died, so that's quite sad. But the second one was kind of bland. I preferred this first Oracle. And she introduces herself and then she tells him not to worry about the vase. And then he replies, what vase? And then literally proceeds to knock a vase off of a table. And it's one of those things like the Oracle goes on to say, would he have dropped the vase if she never mentioned it? Uh, yeah, ever have those moments where you question if fate is really a thing and whether we actually have free will or not like is everything predetermined and i think a lot of the time our subconscious uh can lead us on paths that we're familiar with or it believes it knows somehow and because it's from our subconscious when we experience it we take it as fate happening to us when in fact our minds have already set us up to go down a road and uh, fed us with suggestions through our subconscious to make certain choices um, there's been various experiments on that for like um, you know with children for instance they gave uh, children like different colored dollies and um, said you know uh, which dolly do you do you prefer the face of do you like the white dolly do you like the brown dolly blah 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 and the majority of people picked the, the white dollies and it's because the mind has already been programmed uh, subconsciously to see in this particular experiment uh, that the white dog is more friendly, it's more acceptable, it's more of an uh, image of beauty, all these certain things that lead people to make conscious choices but they're through the subconscious mind. It's not that uh, people innately think that white represents beauty or white is better it's just the way that certain things are subconsciously programmed the same way you brands work if you see brands on tv uh just in an advert you see night ticks you see K kfc logos blah 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 when you go out into the conscious world and you're posed with an option do i want nike or adidas do i want kfc or mcdonald's oh and your brain automatically thinks well i've seen more night ticks in adverts so i'm gonna go nike because for some reason it's the better brand oh i'm gonna go kfc because i've seen more kfc adverts so i feel more comfortable choosing something that i've already been programmed to accept as good or relate to 
that is why it's important for us to control to the best that we can what we watch what we listen to uh, who we talk to because these things all get stored in the subconscious mind and they become what feeds into our conscious and ultimately to the choices that we make if you're always talking to people that are negative negative or see negative in everything eventually your subconscious is gonna feed you those negative ideas and when you see things that you may have maybe been neutral about before you're going to have a negative subconscious image of those things to the same degree i don't think that the oracle predicted neo would knock the vase what she done was she fed him a suggestion to which he reacted to in a particular way and that brought about a desired result for the oracle now we have to remember that she is in the matrix and she's a part of neo's unconscious mind the unconscious feeding knowledge feeding suggestions into the conscious mind to be manifested yeah well why why did she do that then because it's important for the oracle that neo trusts her similarly it's important for our own unconscious minds that we trust it our unconscious mind needs us to trust the things that it suggests so that we make the right choices it's only if trust is established by the oracle proving that she can see into the future that neo is going to trust what she says the same way it's only by our unconscious proving that what it's suggesting is better or good for us that we're going to choose it consciously you know in our day-to-day -day lives if somewhere in the back of your mind you can hear you know a little voice or a niggling feeling saying you know what don't 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 go there today or don't do this today and then later on in the news you see something say oh there was an explosion or an attack or delays or whatever and you're like wow like i did have a feeling that i shouldn't have gone into there and it was and look look what happened that is your that's an example of your unconscious mind or you listening to your unconscious and beginning to trust in it trusting in that gut feeling trusting in that little voice all these little things and what happens is as you listen to that voice more as you trust that unconscious unconscious uh unconscious suggestions more you're gonna be more likely to choose that option every time every time the oracle predicts something and it comes true you're going to be more likely to trust what the oracle is telling you and that's what she's doing here in a very short space of time oh neo watch out don't worry about the vase what vase smash oh my god she knew the vase was going to fall down i can trust what i can trust that she knows what she's talking about whether she really predicted that i i'm honestly not sure but i don't think she did i think it's more likely that she is trying to awaken the potential inside neo and she needs like i said for her to trust the things that she's going to say in order for him internally to think okay maybe i am the one because at the moment he doesn't believe it he's so self-conscious we also have to remember that he's really in reality he in the reality of the matrix he is down in his unconscious somewhere like i said before the matrix is inside neo's mind every time we go in every time he goes into the matrix we are seeing what's inside neo's unconscious he is really down in a part of his unconscious meeting with a hidden part of himself that he doesn't yet understand and that he doesn't yet trust and he's down there in order to meet that part of himself build trust with it learn from it and then come back to con uh, his conscious reality and make the changes based on the suggestions that he's learned from himself it's quite complex but that's what these uh, scenes represent and that's why morpheus brought him there he guided him like a guided meditation if you like to a part of his unconscious that he needs to meet and unlock in order to achieve his true potential the, the oracle and just just to kind of back this up and confirm that because all, you know the signs are all there within the film the oracle shows neo a plaque on the kitchen wall and it says temet noske which is latin for know thyself it's not an accident that that message is there in the kitchen that, that is there to tell him that he is there to know himself he's there to get to know who he is he's there to understand that he's talking with a 
part of himself. The oracle was helping to him to know himself. And remember, his whole his whole journey is a quest to know himself, to know who he truly is. Anyway, the oracle then goes on to examine his hand and his face, and and then she tells him, "Sorry, you got the gift, but you're not the one." And she says, "You, you know, you got the gift, but it looks like you're waiting for something." What exactly, Neo? doesn't know and neither did, does the oracle and she says well maybe the next life you know who knows what you're waiting for and the neo kind of admits that morpheus or had almost convinced him that he was the one and then uh, the oracle goes on to tell neo that morpheus believes in so in neo so much that he will sacrifice his own life to save neos and that neo must choose whether to save himself or Morpheus but she tells uh, Neo not to worry about it though um, and as soon as he steps outside he'll remember that he doesn't believe in any of this fake crap and that he's in control of his own his own life um, it's a quite a special moment because at this point Neo's unconscious is telling him that it doesn't matter what anyone believes about him or what anyone tells him and that his life is all up to him it's it's all in his own hands essentially you know whether he wins loses succeeds or fails saves morpheus or not uh it's not up to the oracle or fate but up to him and he he's reconnecting with his confidence his faith and belief in himself um which is what he's been lacking this entire time and then she gives him a cookie and tells him that he'll feel better once he's done eating it um, the cookie, as far as I can tell, doesn't have any significance other than uh, just being something to distract him from what's just been said. Because what she's actually been doing is a, a smart bit of reverse psychology. Um, because she's telling him that he's not, he's not the one. Um, and what that does, it, it fuels his desire to be the one you know when you you know if you say to someone oh i knew you couldn't do it you know it's like what like it fuels them to say oh, hang on no no no, i can do it and you know they they believed you could do it all along but they were using reverse psychology to kind of coax you into doing what they believed you should be doing anyway uh, so neo leaves the oracle's kitchen uh, and he comes out into the hallway where morpheus is waiting uh, and reconfirms what the oracle has said by telling him that um, Morpheus confirms what the oracle has said by telling Neo whatever was said is for him and him alone it doesn't matter to Morpheus what the oracle has told him and what Neo has said to the oracle because to Morpheus it doesn't change who Neo is to him um, and as the team leave the oracles um, flat, they make their way to uh, go and exit the matrix. And Neo has this experience of deja vu. Um, and he says, oh, I just had deja vu. And the, the team explains to him that deja vu is usually a glitch in the matrix uh, that only happens when they, the machines, uh, change something. Uh, something they change something that's not meant to be there or they add or remove something from the matrix um, I really like the explanation that they give about deja vu because it's one of those things that I've experienced many a time since being a child but never really understood how or why it occurred even though I have researched it numerous times um, only to really read scientists explaining it away as a type of brain lapse where the brain processes the same uh, bit of information twice really quickly by mistake sort of like a double take uh, making you think that you saw something uh, that you've seen before at a previous time the thing with that theory for me is that um, I've seen myself do or say things as an adult while I was a child and then wondered what the hell it was and it's only years later as an adult when i've lived out this particular sequence of events that i saw when i was a child um 
it was only at that point when I lived it out, it was clear what I was seeing when I was, I was a child, you know. It took years for me to get to being an adult, I lived the experience in a particular sequence and then remember, oh, this is what I saw all them years ago. The space between the two events is too vast for it to possibly be a quick lapse of the brain processing a particular piece of information twice. It's kind of wild, but for me, it destroys the theory that the brain is having a lapse. Like I lived with memories of seeing things, seeing events of my adult and teen life throughout my childhood, only to have the deja vu and remember it occur when I was an adult. You know, you know, while I was a child, I was I, I remember standing out on the patio on one on, out on the uh, garden decking one time and I had this like vision if you like of me doing or saying a particular thing and then i remember the vision being gone and me still standing there on the decking thinking what the hell was that and saying to you know the people around me parents friends who are our family whoever like i just had this thing and they're like oh yeah deja vu duh, 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 duh. but like i'm not seeing something that's already happened i'm just seeing something happening not and not knowing what it was and then years later it happened what I saw happened and I was like at that point I was like wow whatever I saw as a kid this is what it was like you know how is it possible that it's a brain lapse if I saw myself as an adult while I was still a child my adult self didn't exist yet you know I'm not saying uh, a glitch in the matrix is what it is uh, or that there are machines doing something and changing something uh, I like that idea, but I don't necessarily think that's what's really happening to us in our actual lives. But I do believe there's more to it than what scientists have tried to explain it as. Anyway, uh, next we have a really long sequence where Cypher betrays the group. Uh, the agents find the group. Um, they get Morpheus. Cypher gets out of the Matrix. Uh, he kills a few of the team by unplugging them and then he goes on a rant about how Morpheus tricked them uh, and that he didn't set them free but set them up to fight in a war and it reminds me a lot again of Judah, Judas Iscariot from the Bible uh, in some ways it kind of gives us an insight into how Judas may have felt and why he betrayed Jesus I mean, Jesus is very similar to Neo in this situation. He has all these disciples leave their families. Uh, Jesus is like Morpheus, sorry. Uh, he has all these disciples leave their families, their riches, their jobs and so on to follow him, uh, which he says is the way, the truth, you know, and the life. But in return, they experience, um, they experience poverty persecution by the agents the lack of food with the, just the slop that they're eating isolation from society is very similar to what the disciples of jesus would have experienced um you know exactly what jesus was offering truth and the true way is exactly what morpheus was offering them uh, the truth but obviously again at a high price their comfy lives and uh, in the same way Judas was, uh, Cypher was tired of it, you know, and wanted out. So he sold out Neo's location, just like uh, Judas did in, like, the, I think it's the Garden of Gethsemane. I think, I think it's Luke 22, um, where Judas uh, betrays Jesus uh, while he's gone to pray. And he brings like the soldiers to where Jesus is kind of, he's not hiding, but he's, he's keeping it low key. Um, Cypher does the same thing to these guys. And yet, do you ever have like, um, let me see, okay. you ever have like colleagues or friends or people that are there with you at the beginning of something, you know, and then at some point they betray you or leave or quit when things get tough or too hard? You know, sometimes it's not. It hurts, but it's not strictly you that they've had enough of or they're quitting on. Uh, a lot of the time, it's the path that you're on. Je Judas had love for Jesus, but he, he couldn't take and walk the path and the consequences of that path or the challenges 
that came with the path that Jesus was on. That's probably why he killed himself after Jesus was crucified. It was the guilt of betraying a friend. You know, like not everyone who's with you at the start is going to be able to walk the path that you're walking and people that you meet along the way also are not all going to be able to walk the path that you're walking especially if it's a like disciplined focused driven path you know um and if you're someone that's positive and encouraging you might fall into this trap of encouraging them to continue and hang on in hang on in there on the path when what they really want and need to do is leave you see the thing is when someone's had enough of something and wants to get off whether it's a relationship or a journey or a job whatever you have to let them you know because if you don't they're eventually going to turn on you because you're going to be the one keeping them in it you know keeping them in something that they don't want to be in and um if in order for them for them to save themselves from it they have to take you out to get out of it then you know so be it kind of thing if people want to go never try and make them stay like they're only going to resent you for it and you are going to be the one who ends up paying all right so in the matrix now trinity is on the phone trying to reason with cypher who's out of the matrix now and calling back uh to them in the matrix and cypher uh is telling them is telling matrix uh, telling matrix telling trinity that he's out he's, he's done with the matrix now and he um trinity is trying to tell him look man like you you're free now you can't go back to the matrix man it's not real but cypher's like yo he believes that the matrix is more real than the real world and to prove it he pulls the plug on two of the team uh ghost and forget what the other one's called i think it's ghost kind of remember but two of the other members of the team he pulls their plug and obviously they die in the matrix and they die in the real world um and then he tells her how he is going to be plugged back into the matrix in order to live there permanently interesting thing is i don't know who's going to plug cypher back into the matrix because smith isn't in the real world smith is in the matrix so it's not like he can plug cypher in so i'm not sure whether that's a flaw in the story or it's just something we never see because it never happens uh, but i did wonder who was going to do that so again some people will see truth and see the right path and still want to live in the comfort of this false reality and go back to it these and you know these people will do whatever it takes to get back to that reality and not have to deal with the truth so be, be careful of anyone that denies truth or always has a ne has an answer or a negative when you show them truth or a, an instant rebuttal when you show them truth especially when you know that they've seen and experienced the same things that you have but still deny or reject it or when you show them evidence of the truth and they deny or reject it a lot of the time these people they see but they don't want to know they don't want to accept and a lot of the time they'll stop at nothing to realize their desire to live in ignorance and darkness if they can and if they can you know what the deepest thing if they can yeah they will convince you to follow them as well because they want company in their misery have you ever not have you not ever heard the phrase that misery loves company hmm. they want people to follow with them man they know they're on the wrong path they know they're falling right down they know they're going wrong but they want people to come down with them you see it all the time with children or young people oh he did it too oh she did it too oh, I did it. straight away they want people to go down with them anyway cypher decides to make this obligatory long-winded villain speech as they always do before they kill the hero instead of just killing them and done in it all and he and he says it would take some kind of miracle to stop him pulling neo's plug and killing him but da da tank the operator pops out of nowhere he wasn't really dead and he comes back and kills cypher and brings trinity and neo back to reality 
And maybe Tank was a guardian angel after all. I don't know if you remember me saying that in the first part of this uh, of this podcast in part one. So they discuss options, and Tank suggests that they they've got to unplug and kill Morpheus to uh, prevent the agents from breaking him and accessing his mind to receive, retrieve the codes to the Zion mainframe which is what um, Smith wants. He wants the codes to the Zion mainframe in order to shut down Zion. And each ship operator uh, who comes into the real world gets the codes in there implanted into their mind, basically. Uh, at this point, Neo has a realization that it's up to him to return to the Matrix and stop the agents from getting these codes from Morpheus's mind. In, rather than them killing Morpheus uh, so now he's risen back up from the unknown he's coming to that point he's coming back above the surface of the unknown and gaining confidence from all the understanding and knowledge of his self that he's been gaining while in the unconscious and he's ready now to begin the final stages of his hero's journey um, so both Trinity and Tank uh, attempt to persuade Neo out of going back and tell him that it's suicide to, to try and go in and take on the agents but Neo refuses to listen and explains that you know not only does he have to do it but actually he's not the one um, you know he doesn't believe he's the one what he does believe though is that he's the life of his friend is more important than his own life and that he must sacrifice himself uh, to save Morpheus and his friends. Uh, what Neo doesn't get yet is that it is the selfless sacrifice that makes him the one. Ah, <laughs> uh, the sacrifice of self for the salvation of others is like the it's like the ultimate price, you know, of the hero. Uh, the the price the hero must be willing to pay to reach the completion of his journey. We see that again in the Christ mythology over and over throughout history with every incarnation of uh, a Christ figure sacrificing themselves for the lives, lives of others. Um, it's classic. It's classic hero's journey cycle. Anyway, meanwhile, back in the Matrix, Smith uh, is trying to break Morpheus, telling him that he has concluded that humans are not mammals so smith's on a, smith's on his own villain's rant before he starts to break uh, morpheus again it's such a, a a classic film trope that their main villains like talk so much before doing the instead of just doing the killing you know so he's there waffling on about uh, mammals mammals naturally um establish an uh, equilibrium with their surroundings and grow in harmony with it whereas humans on the other hand move into a place multiply until all the resources are consumed and then the only way that they continue can continue to survive is to move to a new area and then consume the resources there and then move and then consume over and over again until there's nothing left uh, he says that there's another organism that follows the same pattern which is a virus. <laughs> he does make a good point. Uh, anyway, Neo and Trinity enter back into the Matrix and get equipped to go into the building Morpheus is being held in. Uh, an interesting point to note is that Neo and Trinity go back into the Matrix together and this can represent uh, both parts of Neo uh, moving in union now. The masculine and feminine nature working together him uh, his masculine working at, uh, in in kind of tandem with his anima so his conscious and unconscious working together now the two layers of knowledge uh, teaming up if you like uh, and this is, is representative of the holy or sacred union that I talked in talked about in a uh, series 2 episode 1 uh, about the levels of consciousness and dream interpretation anyway, come touch on that a little bit more a little bit further on uh, so smith begins to explain his motivations at this point as well uh, he actually wants to leave the matrix he wants to be free 
interestingly enough he wants his mind to be free um, but he believes that he needs to destroy Zion to achieve that and this makes me think that um, Smith represents the dark or evil side of Neo's unconscious, the destructive part that wants to, you know, just carry out its own will uh, in the conscious world and feels the need to destroy the essence or representation of good because the darkness is being suppressed by the good and it's not being chosen because the conscious mind is aware of goodness, aware that there is goodness, aware that there is a Zion, a, a heaven if you like to go to and is making a conscious choice based on that awareness to not do good, uh, to not do evil but to do good. Do you remember I, I was saying that um, Zion represents heaven in the Bible um, but also possibly here in the film, like a utopia where all the freed believers go. Do you remember Tank said, um, if the war was over today and we won, like the party would be in Zion. Well, if we stick with that idea that heaven is the unconscious, you know, heaven is in the unconscious and that the idea that if you do good, you will enter paradise. Um, that is something that people keep in their mind to help prevent them doing bad things if you like or embracing the dark side you see it in religion a lot if you uh you know you you don't commit any sins blah 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 you go to heaven eternal life all that sort of stuff and it keeps people away from doing wrong um but also entertaining the dark thoughts that they have you know a lot of religion concentrates on controlling the mind on discipline and staying away from uh, thoughts that are sinful or whatever uh, in the same way it could be that um, Smith thinks that if he destroys Zion the image of heaven in the mind that the 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 mind of the person he's inhabiting if you like has no paradise to refer to no heaven to hold in place as a reward for being good and at that point you know the mind is free to embrace dark thoughts and dark actions because there's no consequence really and there's no reward uh you know there's no reason why you would be consciously suppressing evil or choosing light if there's no heaven to go to if you like i mean you could argue that good genuinely good people don't need to believe uh, or be persuaded by the, the idea of going to heaven to do good and i agree with that um however if your concept and understanding of what is good is destroyed then how do you know or determine what is good and what is not it becomes entirely subjective uh, so by that logic, I believe that Smith thinks that the destruction of Zion, goodness, because that's what it represents in the film, uh, will result in his ability to rise from the unconscious to Neo's active conscious mind and possess Neo's mind and carry out his will in the real world so that he no longer has to remain uh, trapped in the darkness of Neo's unconscious. Remember, Smith wants to be free from the Matrix, meaning he wants to enter into the real world. The only way he can enter into the real world, because he doesn't have a physical body, he has to inhabit somebody's body. He has to inhabit, he has to completely take over a mind and inhabit that body in order for him to be in the real world. He doesn't have a physical body. He's born in the Matrix. He's a program. You know? All right, so just a little side note on that. I believe that we, you know, we all have dark and light within us, but we make conscious choices to embrace either one or the other in our lives. And it's not always one or the other. You know, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Sometimes it's more of one or the other. But I think all of the time there are both wills. Uh, kind of fighting against us wanting to be brought uh, up from the unconscious into conscious action you know so although Smith is the dark side of Neo blah 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 you know let's say um, he's not exclusive 
from Neo's good side and he's not exclusively dark, you know. He does have uh, feelings, if you like, uh, and reasoning behind his actions. He does want to be free. Although his reasoning is selfish, uh, and as we just saw, Neo's good uh, actions are selfless, um, he does still have some sort of uh, conscious desire if you like uh, Smith I'm talking about alright so probably the best uh, scene in any of the Matrix films <laughs> this one guns lots of guns uh, so Neo uh, and Trinity uh, go back into the Matrix and they like they they have lockers and lockers and lockers and lockers of guns to choose from. They bag up all these guns and they uh, enter into this building that they're going to infiltrate and um, they just start shooting everything to pieces, running up walls, flipping off walls, flying through the air, bullet time, which. Uh, I don't think I'd ever really seen it in a film before. You know when time slows down and the bullets are flying past really slow. I don't think that had been done in in, in, in any big films like this before. Uh, but And all sorts of amazing kind of action film stuff uh, is happening. And at this point, Neo's, like I was saying, Neo's masculine and feminine are working together in unison and union. Um, you see Trinity's running this way, Neo's running that way, they're like spinning around off each other, shooting each other, got each other's backs. Both parts of him are working together, like I said, in unison and union. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best action scenes ever. It was so good, it was even good in the Matrix game uh, on PS2. Uh, so anyway, they rescue Morpheus, like they shoot up everyone and everything. They crash uh, a helicopter, Neo saves Trinity from like falling off the side of a building because the helicopter's crashing and uh, the, the, the three of them, uh, they realise that, you know, actually Neo is the one, even if Neo doesn't fully understand it himself. Um, and then he says to Morpheus, but the Oracle told me I wasn't the one. And then Morpheus interrupts him and says, look, the Oracle told you exactly what you needed to hear. That's all. And um, remember I was saying about um, the vase and the Oracle kind of predicting it was going to fall and using psych reverse psychology on him. Like Neo needed to believe in himself to become who he needed to be. Not He didn't need to believe in fate or destiny or even in the Oracle's predictions, simply himself. You know, the... the the oracle told him what he needed to hear in order to make that happen uh, because the, the oracle telling him that he is the one means he would have been reliant on the oracle's prediction whereas her telling him he's not the one means that he had to find that within himself so Morpheus goes on to say that eventually you realize that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path and a lot of people find themselves like knowing what needs to be done, how to do it, and you know what they need to do in their lives to become the best versions of themselves, but they don't do it. Like they know the path, but they don't walk the path. And as a result, they don't become who they need to be. Um, I think it's important for us to not just acquire knowledge, you know, it's useless. Uh, you need to apply the knowledge. Don't become someone who just knows uh, the truth and the path and talks about it. Just walk it, you know. Anyway, uh, so the team, right, they get off this roof, they've got Morpheus, they want to get out of the Matrix now. So they head down to the underground, uh, to this phone box to exit the Matrix. Um, and Trinity starts to confess, like, what the Oracle has told her about Neo and about, you know, her, uh, their relationship and everything. And she's like, everything has come true. Apart from this, apart from him, like, being the one and, you know, saving her and stuff. And then suddenly, uh, Smith, the agent, appears and tries to shoot her, but she quickly picks up the phone and escapes. So that conversation gets cut short. And um, what we have left, what we have there, actually, just before I move on, is uh, Neo and his anima about to romantically connect 
and uh, if you look at some versions of the detailed version of the hero's journey you'll see that there's a space for the wild bride and groom and that's what I meant by this holy uh, union this holy marriage between uh, the two the two uh, parts of him the masculine and feminine the unconscious and conscious and his anima uh, his other half if you like is moving from being an external guide a mother a helper to being or to, to defining her uh, to beginning to define her role as the wife or the lover the intimate partner and that but that hasn't taken place yet it's just starting to take place and they're beginning to converge but it hasn't happened yet before that can happen neo has to face his nemesis smith and that's the deepest, darkest part of his subconscious. Because Neo's on the verge of being completely free from his darkness and not knowing himself. And at this point, he has the option to flee. All he's got to do is pick up the phone and, uh, and get out of there. Actually, no, the, I think uh, the phone got destroyed. But Neo could run and get another phone. Um, but instead just as he t turns around to run he stops and decides you know what he's going to stay and fight because he knows that by running he's only de delaying the inevitable and he's not going to be truly free he's always going to be on the run so he stays to fight um, and Trinity and Tank can't understand what he's doing but Morpheus who's out now as well says that Neo is finally starting to believe believe in himself and that he has the power to overcome the darkness within him and free not free not just himself but also those who are with him the team you see like neo overcoming his fear it doesn't eliminate uh, just liberate him but his friends too it's like sometimes the freedom of others um relies on us becoming the best versions of ourselves so um, Neo and Smith start fighting, shooting, flying across the screen, bullet dodging and eventually they run out of bullets and they have to go hand to hand and uh, scuffling and swinging it out and all that. It, it, Neo manages to throw uh, Smith onto the tracks, he gets hit by the train and he thinks it's over and he, he makes his way out of the subway but then the train stops and Smith comes back and then he starts chasing him and they run out of the subway and Neo calls Tank to give him an exit uh, I thought it was interesting that at this point he calls him Mr. Wizard he's never called no one's ever called him that at any other point in the film which I thought was kind of out of place but and interesting I couldn't really work out what if if it was relevant at all anyway at this point the entire matrix is against Neo he's on the verge of being free but the system is controlling every single person in the city or world and changing them into agents to stop Neo. So not only is Smith after Neo, but the entire world is against him. And it's like what Morpheus said earlier on, anyone who's not in plug, unplugged has the potential to become an agent. And do, like, have you ever thought to yourself that like everyone around you is like just trying to keep you down or the whole world is against you you know like no one really wants to see you kind of make it out that that crab in a barrel mentality you know just holding you back and uh, what we can what we see here is similar to that everyone in the town is being used by smith and the matrix the system to stop neo leaving no one wants him to get that clarity nobody wants him to get that freedom and make it out uh, especially smith uh, because Smith wants the exact same thing to be free and that crab in a barrel mentality is like everybody wants to get out but they don't want to let anybody else go first or before them you know sometimes we can feel we're on the when we're on the verge of a breakthrough breakthrough like everyone the entire world is against us but like Neo continues pushing continues heading to the goal we have to keep pushing towards the goal uh, meanwhile, right, 
Uh, back in reality on the ne Nebuchadnezzar while Neo's getting chased down, the Sentinels, the robots, have found the ship and are cutting it up and cutting into the ship to kill the team. So it's like all the time Neo is working on himself, trying to get out, blah, blah, blah. The machines are attacking his friends the same way sometimes all the time we're taking and working on ourselves, developing, finding ourselves taking time to self-actualize the systems and the people that are part of the systems are trying to kill our people you know they are uh, relying on us to ex an extent to make it out and that that's quite a really heavy burden um to think about you know like if you don't get to where you need to be if you don't become who you need to be then the people that are around you will die essentially you know <laughs> they may physically die it may may not be a physical death it may be some other death poverty or i don't know isolation i'm not sure um but you know this it's a heavy burden to think about you know you've got a responsibility to help everybody else get out of the kind of out of the matrix you know out of these systems and then just as neo makes it to the room where the phone's ringing he opens the door and smith's already in there uh, waiting and he kills him uh, how he knew which door to be behind and i'm not exactly sure uh, so everyone's in shocked right now and they're kind of forced to accept that ah uh, oh, maybe neo wasn't the one you know he falls to the ground he can't believe he's been shot and he dies um but it's a very symbolic part of the film because Neo is now dead in his unconscious. And this represents him being lost, lost in his unconscious, lost in the darkness, so lost that his physical body is dead. Notice this though, his anima, Trinity, the deep, genuine part of his unconscious that woke him out of his sleep so many times earlier in the film begins to call to him again yeah in reality on the ship while the ship's going down getting cut into trinity is whispering in neo's ear the ear of his dead body that she's not afraid anymore that she knows now that the oracle told her that she would fall in love with a dead man and that man would be the one and that he can't truly be dead because she loves him uh sorry my bad she doesn't tell him she'd fall in love with a dead man she says she'd just fall in love and that man would be the one that's why he can't truly be dead because she loves him so he can't be dead because she loves him that means he's the one because the oracle told her that she would fall in love with the one and she kisses him and in a kind of reverse role sleeping beauty style turn of events neo wakes up now what happened here in the context of the hero's journey and the unconscious is that his anima that guiding voice that was there from the beginning showing him the way when he was lost called out to him from the depths of his unconscious or in this case into the depths of his unconscious but still kind of externally uh and helped him find his way again another guide in the darkness exactly the way that trinity woke him up way in the very first scene and finally what we're seeing here is the sacred union of his feminine and masculine being complete unconscious and conscious together as one um like the the ultimate intertwining of those two parts you know the confession of the love the coming together romantically it's like the final stage if you like and neo has reached the height of his consciousness and his abilities um it's very similar right to the dream that i had again where i was in the cave and that unknown woman called to me to keep me on the right path and steer me away from being lost to the sirens. That anima reaching in or from the deepest depths of my unconscious to provide that motivation, that guidance, that steering in the darkness 
to the path of consciousness and ultimately awaken. It's one of why it's one of the reasons why I love exploring the kind of psychological and symbolic meanings of these things like dreams and films because it's so deep. It transcends uh, and parallels so many things in real life. You know, it, it all of this may just be ideas and theories and and not you know not nothing even really relative to life but the crossover between them and the amazing ways that our minds can make these connections and see deeper meanings and context to things that would otherwise just confuse and mystify us is amazing anyway neo gets up and the agents immediately begin shooting at him to which neo simply just responds no it's just one word no puts his hand up no and he's saying no to the bullets no to smith no to death no to self-doubt no to loss no to everything that's been holding him back or coming against him and getting in his way finally he's rising up and saying nah like he's not having it anymore you know and it's so deep because what we've seen really uh it's not just neo dying and being lost in his unconscious but we've seen him completely die into himself he went in sacrificed himself completely died to himself complete ego death and rebirth being re- reborn as this divine being the one his unconscious anima and his conscious have completely united becoming one he is a whole individual he knows dark he knows light he know he knows good he knows evil he knows all his weaknesses and his strengths and he can fully use all of his abilities and their potential he know he like no longer has to dodge bullets literally he can stop them in his path you know um and when we fully die to self and have an ego death or allow ourselves to allow the ego to die uh, which i talk about in the very first podcast um when we let go of all the inhibitions ideas ideals we've had of ourselves and ha- and allow our true selves to come to the surface this is when we can achieve our full potential like neo here he's reached his full potential uh, for this film in fact uh, because there are two other films but in this film uh, particularly he's uh, reached his full potential and what it means is his mind is fully conscious remember the matrix is in the mind and he can you know stop bullets mid-air for us when our minds are fully conscious and we understand our abilities and how we can operate within the world that's one that's another thing neo has uh fully understood now how he can operate within the matrix world the the uh limitations and capabilities that he has within that particular world when we understand the limitations that we can operate not 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 just the limitations but the abilities that we have to operate with within the world that we're in the systems that we're in like we're not going to have to dodge these bullets sidestep or even fight we can stop all of those things dead in their tracks simply by knowing the right words you know the the right way to handle or manipulate a situation you know um having the right knowledge and understanding of how and when to apply it is also key to operating within you know these systems and structures uh and then when we can use these systems to our advantage like the spoon and bend them to our will you know um that's when we're going to be able to ultimately control you know the trajectory of our development the people that we impact the world around us and so on and so forth anyway that felt a bit waffly but okay uh so smith tries to attack neo with everything that he's got like um but neo is just too fast too advanced and he can preempt every move that smith makes to the point that he can just stand to one side one hand behind his back and still beat smith um and it's for us to get to the stage where we're so knowledge- knowledgeable, so skilled, such a good understanding uh, of what we're doing 
and such a skilled application of the knowledge that of self that we have that the system doesn't actually matter and it doesn't matter what comes against us we can just take it in our stride it's, it's not stressful you know and we can just apply what we know and come out on top you know it's like if you ever um, are driving somewhere and you have to rely on the a map or a sat nav and you have to look at it for every single turn every single movement it's it's difficult but once you get to learn the journey to a certain degree you don't have to refer to the map so much you don't have to return to the tom tom so much you know what turns are coming and you can make adjustments to your speed your gear everything within good time in order to make that turn it's very similar to that when you have acquired enough knowledge of self and understanding of the systems and how to apply your abilities you're going to see certain turns or twists and things coming up and be like okay i need to make this adjustment in order so that in order when i get so that when i get to that turn or that twist or whatever or whatever comes against me i know how to maneuver ahead of time uh so at this point um smith is uh on the floor he gets up and then neo does something that they've never seen before and he runs at smith and smith prepares himself because he thinks it's going to be another fist fight but neo jumps inside smith and destroys him from the from the inside and it's actually really deep imagery because it can represent us when we get to the point where we've reached our highest self we will understand how to go into the systems into the programs into the structures that are against us and dismantle them from the inside no longer trying to attack from the outside but will be in on the inside breaking it down internally you'll be able to go into your chosen field of work country government club whatever it is and know how to use the systems operate within the systems and deconstruct those parts that are corrupt and against you from the inside and repair them and fix them make it better so here once more uh neo's anima trinity calls to him calls down into his unconscious to remind him that she and the team still need saving so in the real world she's shouting to him and he, he hears her in his unconscious calling to him from externally it's very similar to what i experienced in that dream and i keep relating back to it because it's important for us to remember that although this is a fictional film um, the concepts and symbols relate to real life you know I keep trying to draw it back to real life it's not just a film review it's about how these symbols and psychological concepts apply to our our everyday lives you know and the things we're experiencing so uh trinity calling to him in his subconscious again it represents uh, her calling him to wake up coincidentally uh or maybe not i don't know the the phone is ringing at the same time and it's trinity literally ringing him on the phone uh so just in the nick of time uh neo gets to the phone gets back to the real world uh so that the team can fire the emp electromagnetic pulse to stop the sentinels and stop the uh, nebuchadnezzar being destroyed and neo and trinity kiss you know the final full realization you know of their union in the physical conscious world uh you know sometimes in life like we can't be united with uh, the person who's our other half if you like until we fully realize who we are and self-actualize you know trinity was at was there from the start you know she knew that she was going to fall in love with this person who was meant to be the one you know um she was the one who called to him she was the one who led him to morpheus all these things she was there from the beginning but it's only now at the very end that neo is able to understand himself uh, thoroughly enough to become the other half of that union you know sometimes we need to get to the stage where we are a whole person knowing ourselves properly so that we can complete the other half of this union you know maybe the person is waiting for us to get to where we need to be 
and I always think of myself that way, you know, like, I, I always think, ah, oh, I'm getting to where I need to be, I'm not quite where I need to be, um, you know, in order to be my best self, you know. Uh, so, what follows next is a bit of a Hollywood ending, like Neo does this voiceover to you, the audience, I guess, which is kind of cheesy. Uh, but he says, I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. Now, I'm not sure who he's talking to because, like I said, he's, it feels like he's talking to us, the audience. But then he continues to say how he's going to show the people a world without whoever's on the phone. But you know whatever uh, what he said at the beginning there though is what I want to focus on about people being afraid afraid of change and I think he's bang on people are afraid of those who ignite change they're afraid of, that their old ways will have to go that they'll have to do work that they'll have to stop the habits that they have that they'll have to fix up you know people are afraid to change themselves afraid that they'll lose everything that they will have to start again and if they have to start again they may not find anything as good as what they had before even though what they had before wasn't even great uh, so they hold on to the little that they do have for dear life you know only to sink with it as it goes down and he also said he's not here to tell you how it's going to end but how it's going to begin you know taking a leap of leap of faith is kind of exactly that you know like if you think back to the jump program um you don't know how that jump will work out you know where it's going to land if it will land at all or wherever you will fall you know you might not reach the other side you know um, but in order to reach where you need to be, the other side, you, you need to take that that jump, you know. Um, so no one can tell you where your journey will end, but they can show you where to begin, you know. And you must be open to listen, you know, and follow the right, follow the white rabbit, as it were, down into that rabbit hole of unconsciousness. All right, that's all I got for you for this episode and for this little series, this two-part series, The Matrix, uh, The Symbols and Psychology of the Matrix. Uh, I hope that it's been interesting, uh, giving you a lot to think about, consider, you know, even if you think it's just crazy out there, like wild, like comparisons that I'm making. Um, you know, I hope it's been interesting and you've managed to get something out of it uh, even if it's only a deeper uh, perspective of the film The Matrix alright so definitely leave a comment and let me know what you thought about this whole thing uh, any suggestions anything that came to mind any ideas that sprung to you as you were listening that I didn't touch on any questions um yeah and i will see you i will speak to you in the next podcast peace